You are a fluke. You are a separate event. And you run from the maternity ward to the crematorium and that's it, baby. That's it. Now, why does anybody think that way? There's no reason to, because it isn't even scientific. It's just a myth. And it's invented by people who wanted to feel a certain way. They want to play a certain game. See, the game of God got, got embarrassing. The, the idea of God as the potter, the architect of the universe, is, is, is good. And it makes you feel that life is, after all, important. There is someone who cares. It has meaning. It has sense. And you are valuable in the eyes of the Father. But after a while, it gets embarrassing. You realize that everything you do is being watched by God. He knows your tiniest, inmost feelings and thoughts. And you say after a while, quit bugging me. <laughs> I don't want you around. So you become an atheist. Then, then you feel terrible after that because you got rid of God, but that means you got rid of yourself. You're just nothing but a machine. And your idea that you're a machine is just a machine too. So if you're a smart kid, you commit suicide. Camus said there is only really one serious philosophical question, which is whether or not to commit suicide. I think there are four or five serious philosophical questions. The first one is, who started it? The second is, are we going to make it? The third is, where are we going to put it? The fourth is, who's going to clean up? And the fifth, is it serious? <laughs> but, but still, uh, should you or not commit suicide? This is a good question. Why go on?
and you only go on if the game is worth the candle. Now the universe has been going on for an incredible long time. And so really, a, a satisfactory theory of the universe has to be one that's worth betting on. That's a very, it seems to me, absolutely elementary common sense. If you make a theory of the universe which isn't worth betting on, why bother? Just commit suicide. But if you want to go on playing the game, you've got to have an optimal theory for playing the game. Otherwise, there's no point in it. But the people who coined the fully automatic theory of the universe were playing a very funny game. What they wanted to say was this, all you people who believe in religion are old ladies and wishful thinkers. You've got a big daddy up there and you want a comfort and thing, but life is rough. Life is tough and uh, success goes to the most hard-headed people. That was a very convenient theory when the European-American world was colonizing the natives everywhere else. I said, we are the end product of evolution and uh, we're tough, see? I'm a big strong guy because I face facts and life is just a bunch of junk and I'm going to impose my will on it and turn it into something else, you see? And I'm real hard. See, that's a way of flattering yourself. And so, uh, it has become academically plausible and fashionable that this is the way the world works. In academic circles, no other theory of the world than the fully automatic model is respectable. Because if you're an academic person, you've got to be an intellectually tough person. You've got to be prickly. See, there are basically two kinds of philosophy. One's called prickles, the other's called goo. And uh, prickly people are precise, rigorous, logical, they like everything chopped up and clear. Goo people like it vague. They're, for example, in physics, prickly people believe that the ultimate constituents of matter are particles. Goo people believe it's waves.
and uh, in in uh, philosophy, prickly people are logical positivists, and goo people are idealists. And they're always arguing with each other. And what they don't realize is that they neither one can take his position without the other person. Because you wouldn't know you advocated prickles unless there was somebody else advocating goo. You wouldn't know what a prickle was unless you knew what goo was. Because life is not either prickles or goo, it's gooey prickles and prickly goo. And they go together, like back and front, male and female. And that's the answer to philosophy. See, I'm a philosopher, and I'm not going to argue very much, because if you don't argue with me, I don't know what I think. So if we argue, I say thank you, because uh, going to the courtesy of your taking a different point of view, I understand what I mean, so I can't get rid of you. idea that the universe is just nothing at all but unintelligent force 
playing around, not even enjoying it, is a put-down theory of the world. People who had a, an advantage to make a game to play by putting it down and making out that because they put the world down, they were a superior kind of people. That just won't do. Uh, we've had it. Because if, if you seriously go along with this idea of the world, you are what is technically called alienated. You feel hostile to the world. You feel that the world is a trap. It is a, a mechanism. It's electronic, neurological uh, mechanisms into which you somehow got caught. And you, poor thing, have to put up with being in a body that's falling apart and uh, get the cancer. Doctors are trying to help you out, but they really can't succeed in the end. And you're just going to fall apart, and it's a grim business, and it's too bad. So if you think that that's the way things are, you may as well commit suicide right now.
and say, well, I damn it. Because there really, after all, there might be eternal damnation. In the back of the thing, if I did that, or uh, then I identify with my children or something, and I think of them going on and without me and uh, nobody to support them. But of course, if I do go on in this frame of mind and continue to support them, I shall merely teach them to be like I am. And they'll go on dragging it out to support their children and they won't enjoy it. And they'll be afraid to commit suicide and so will their children. They all learn the same lesson. You've got to make a move which will put yourself out of your own control into the control of a better. If you don't believe in the Christian kind of a God, you can believe in the Hindu kind of a God who is your inner self. I remember the feel of the air touch my skin and my re Cause I felt something leave from within I feel empty, have I got nothing left to give Am I living, cause I only felt alive with him I'm driving in the night, the hood down It's when I feel alive, when the world's around The darkness deep inside comes to light it's alright, it's alright I can bring no hearts if I got none I won't break apart if I stay on the run Cause sometimes in the night I miss the sun 
my heart give up? Why did darkness grow? I felt the lightning shake me into hell. Why did darkness grow? I wanna stay in here where I feel Why did darkness grow? Darkness a lower self which you can call your ego that's that little scoundrelous fellow that's always out for me but behind the ego there is the atman the inner self the inward light as quakers would call it the real self the spirit which is substantially identical with god
meditate in such a way that you identify with your higher self. Now, how do you do that? Well, you start by watching all your thoughts. Very carefully. Watching your feelings, watching your emotions. So that you begin to build up a sense of separation between the watcher and what is watched. as it were, no longer carried away by your own stream of consciousness. You remain the witness, impassively, impartially, suspending judgment and watching it all go on. That seems to be something like progress. At least you're taking an objective view of what is going on. You are beginning to be in a position to control it, but just wait a minute. watch that one? It's interesting if you do, because you find out, of course, that this is just as the problem of grace is nothing more than a transposition of the first problem. How am I to be unselfish? By my own power. It becomes how am I to get grace by my own power. So in the same way we find that the watching self or the observing self behind all our thoughts and feelings is itself a thought. That is to say,
When the police enter a house in which there are thieves, the thieves go up from the ground floor first. When the police arrive on the first floor, the thieves have gone up to the second, and so to the third, and finally out to the roof. And so when the ego is about to be unmasked, it immediately identifies with the higher self. It goes up a level. Because the religious game is simply a refined and highbrow version of the ordinary game. How can I outwit me? How can I one-up me?
I find, for example, that in the quest for pleasure, the ordinary pleasures of the world, food, sex, power, possessions, all this becomes a drag. And I think, no, it isn't there. So I go in for the arts, and literature, poetry, music. And I absorb myself in, the, in those pleasures. And after a while, they aren't the answer. So I go to psychoanalysis, you see. And uh, then I find out that's not the answer. And I go to religion. But I'm still seeking what I was seeking when I wanted candy bars. I see now that, of course, it's not going to be a material goodie. All material goodies fall apart. But maybe there's a spiritual goodie that's not going to fall apart. But in that quest, the quest is not different from the quest for the candy bar. Same old story, only you've refined the candy bar and made it abstract and holy and blessed and so on. So it is with the higher self. The higher self's your old ego. And you sure hope it is eternal. the great problem is how to get that higher self working. How, how does it make any difference to what you do and what you think? I know all kinds of people who've got this higher self going, practicing their yoga, but they're just like ordinary people, sometimes a little worse. And uh, they can fool themselves. They can say, for example, well, my point of view in religion is very liberal. I believe that all religions have uh, divine revelation in them. But I don't understand the way you people fight about it.
Jehovah's Witnesses have the real religion. Others say, well, we Roman Catholics have it. And the Muslims say, no, it is in the Quran. And this is the right way. And somebody else gets up, and he may be a rather highbrow Catholic, and say, well, God has given the Spirit through all the traditions, but ours is the most refined and mature. said they're all equally revelations of the divine and in seeing this of course I'm much more tolerant than you are <laughs> you see how that game is going to work yeah I could take this position supposing you regard me as some sort of a guru and you know how gurus hate each other they're always putting each other down
And I could say, well, I don't put other gurus down. See, that outwits all of them. <laughs> See, we're always doing that. We're always finding a way to be one up. And by the most incredibly subtle means. So you see that, you see? And you say, I realize I'm always doing that. Now tell me, how do I not do that? I say, why do you want to know? <laughs> well, I'd be better that way. Yeah, but why do you want to be better? You see, the reason you want to be better is the reason why you aren't. Shall I put it like that? aren't better because we want to be. Because the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because all the do-gooders in the world, whether they're doing good for others or doing it for themselves, are troublemakers. On the basis of kindly let me help you or you'll drown, said the monkey, putting the fish safely up a tree. <laughs>
on a rampage for the past hundred or more years to improve the world. We have given the benefits of our culture, our religion, our technology to everybody, except perhaps the Australian Aborigines. And we have insisted that they receive the benefits of our culture, even our political styles, our democracy. You had better be democratic, or we'll shoot you. And having conferred these blessings all over the place, we wonder why everybody hates us.
sometimes doing good to others and to even doing good to oneself is amazingly destructive. Because it's full of conceit. How do you know what's good for other people? How do you know what's good for you? If you say uh, you want to improve, then you ought to know what's good for you. But obviously you don't. the verge of figuring out how to breed any kind of human character uh, we would want to have. We can give you saints, philosophers, scientists, great politicians, anything you want. Just tell us what kind of human beings ought to be. genetically unregenerate make up our minds what genetically generate people might be. Because I'm afraid very much that our selection of virtues may not work. It may be like, for example, this new kind of high yield grain which was made and uh, which is becoming ecological. some way in which we have to pay for it. 
And I can well see that eugenically produced human beings might be dreadful. Every day we escape Losing all of our faith We can't live this way Feel me slowly fade away Feel me slowly fade away As far as the wind will take me Every day I feel time that? Any animal considered in itself is virtuous. It does its thing. But in crowds, they're awful.